Good evening. This is Political Forum for Wednesday, October 30th. We welcome today as our guest, Illinois State Representative Christian Mitchell of the 26th District. I'm Dartesia Pitts, your host today, and also a board member of CAN TV. This is a live interactive program. So if you're tuned in now, please join in the conversation. Give us a call at 312-738-1060. First, I want to welcome you, State Rep Christian Thank Mitchell. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on. And I had an opportunity to talk to you a lot prior to um, us coming on air. And I learned a lot about you and also what you're doing. Where is the 26th district? So, so first of all, thank you, Dartesia, for doing this. Thank you to, to Can TV for, for having me. I, I always enjoy this program. So uh, the 26th district is, is, in my opinion, the best district in the state, and I'm a little biased. Uh, but it runs from uh, Streeterville, so Goethe and uh, Dearborn on the near north side, all the way down to 92nd and Exchange in South Chicago. So very, uh, very long, very diverse. Uh, great universities, museums, parks, and, and of course some of the best people on the planet. So uh, I'm very blessed. Okay, that's a, that is um, a, a long stretch of land or a, a large district. And this is something random. What what have you? Um, what are some of your favorite points of interest within your within wow. your district? So I have I have every museum except the Museum of Science and Industry, and, and I, I love museums. I have the Shedd Aquarium, which was always my favorite place to go as a kid, which I, I love a great deal. Okay. We have fantastic restaurants. I, I have to give a plug for uh, Chicago Chicken and Waffles, which is kind of my spot okay. and, and which I enjoy a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, we're right near the University of Chicago, which is my alma mater and, mm -hmm. and uh, a great place to visit. So okay. those. Are are, are, those are some of my my favorite highlights, and of course we have we have great parks and, and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. So Grand Park as well. We have great parks. No, we don't have Grand Park. Oh, Grand Park's Grand a little Park? Okay. too far west uh, of gotcha. us at that point. I believe that's Ken Duncan, my colleague. Okay. Okay. Well, you have a lot going on in the twenty sixth okay. district. Well, um, this is also your inaugural term, right? It is. So congratulations. Thank you. And all that good stuff, and you are up for reelection. Or primaries are sure. in March. I am. So how long is the term for a state representative? So it's two years, and uh, so I was sworn in January 9th, and uh, November, I'm sorry, sorry, September, we start circulating renominating petitions. So okay. it's two years, but basically you're kind of running every nine months. So okay, yeah, that's Not necessarily busy. ideal. You are, you are quite busy. That's and, busy, yeah. And I know everybody talks about term limits, and I get why that seems popular. I, I would just say that I think part of our struggle as mm -hmm. a state, part of uh, the reason why we don't do long-term planning, why we don't incentivize government to think about the future is the fact that we're running every two years and so folks are kind of constantly thinking about re-election so don't like that part very much but i'm always willing to be accountable to the people so i'm, I'm honored to Definitely take a chance multitasking juggling a lot right yes ma'am i'm trying and um i had an opportunity to talk to you and uh, you are one of the youngest state reps in office am i right i actually i am i am the youngest wow uh, so some people made baby crying noises the first time i spoke on the floor uh, but I'm the youngest. I'm 27 years old. Uh, there's a, a Republican from downstate who is also 27, about a year and a half, or I'm sorry, a month and a half older than I am. So, oh, wow. Uh, I'm one of the, the, the younger folks there. Oh, so I love, love it. I'm loving it. Thank so, um, and as you can see, State Rep is, um, State Rep Representative Mitchell is very impressive. And I had an opportunity to talk to him about all types of things um, that are pending down in Springfield. So one of the, one of the items or, uh, uh, area of interest that we discussed was education. Absolutely. What's going on with education? So, so education is 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 my key issue. It's the issue I care most about. Uh, it's the reason why I'm sitting here. The sacrifices that my mother made to send me to the best schools that she possibly could are the only reason that I'm I'm sitting here right now. So there's a, a couple of, of big things going on. The, the biggest is that there is finally a really important conversation about how we fund education in the state of Illinois. So right now what happens to our teachers is that we, we, form a, we, we spend an overwhelming number of our education dollars are from local property taxes. Mm -hmm. So if you live in a high property wealth area, then you get uh, extra dollars for your schools. You can pay your teachers more, you have more after school programs, you have uh, better pre-K, you have better wraparound services, the kids are eating better, all those things. Um, and the problem then is that if you don't live in that sort of neighborhood, uh, your, your zip code ends up governing your chances at life. And, and in an era where you earn what you learn, 
Um, that's been devastating for our kids, especially black and brown kids, especially the south and west sides of the city of Chicago. So it's a real conversation about how the state does what it's constitutionally supposed to do, which is pick up more than half the cost of, of sending kids to school and basically increasing the foundation level. Mm -hmm. And that's really exciting because it would free up money for local districts to spend more on the wraparound services we need to make sure that kids are getting the early childhood education that's going to put them on a path to success, to make sure that they're getting the after school programs to keep mm -hmm. them interested, the art and music classes, they're going to engage their creativity. So I'm really excited about that effort. I think it is literally the most important thing that we can do this upcoming session to change the game for our young people. So I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's got to get some more legs in the house. We got to keep pushing forward. You know, our constituents need to call us and, and make sure they push on us. But I'm really excited about it. Okay, and of course, as we discussed prior to coming on air, education is you know from which everything else flows. Absolutely. So, um, including the criminal justice system. Yeah. So if we do not educate our youth and you know put the funding there then we have a, a, a bigger set of issues yes, like absolutely. criminal justice what's going on with criminal justice and the policies and laws down and yeah Springfield? so uh, I, I want to underscore what you just said I mean the money that we don't spend up front on early childhood education is money that we spend on the back end on social services on prisons on all these things that are much much more expensive than actually just educating a kid in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's a real conversation right now. Everyone knows there's a lot of crime in, in, in our community, especially as I said on the south and west sides of Chicago, a lot of gun violence. And so uh, there's an effort in Springfield right now to have a conversation about how we can uh, increase penalties for those, those folks who are the worst of the worst who are mm -hmm. using guns to terrorize our community. There's real concern, though, because the current piece of legislation uh, has no real leniency for first-time offenders. And there also needs to be a real conversation about the way in which, for example, the war on drugs has not worked. And part of the reason why our prisons are so full to the point where this bill is going to cost something like $300 million in construction costs, and possibly less than that, the estimates have varied, is that we've got so many people in prison for crimes that we we're treating as a public safety problem that are actually a public health problem, like drug addiction, like the economic crimes of theft and retail theft and prostitution institution that kind of uh, are, are products of right. that drug addiction. So mm -hmm. that's, I hope, where the conversation is going to move. Currently right. it's all about uh, penalty enhancement, but I'm hoping that as we have that conversation about how we get the worst of the worst off the streets, mm -hmm. that we can also talk about how we get some folks who don't need to be in prison out of prison. That's definitely a dialogue to um, continue. We have a caller, though. Hi, caller. Yes, good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are you? Not bad. I have a question for you, sir. Um, yes, sir. Mayor Emanuel um, lately has been talking about, and is actually is doing, he's raising parking violations, putting up speed cameras, really uh, tightening the belt on uh, Chicago taxpayers to help uh, the city's budget. But he says that if Springfield doesn't do anything with pension reform, we could even be in worse shape next year looking at, you know, raising um, uh, city property taxes or eliminating some vital services. I just want to see uh, what your take is on that. Yeah, so, so thanks for your, your question. So just for folks who don't have uh, kind of the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, fighting a cold, don't have all the background. So there have been, there's this pension reform debate right now in Springfield, and there's been two competing proposals. Uh, one from the House uh, that goes a little further but is a little harsher on our, our public employees. Uh, one that doesn't go quite as far in the Senate but is considered to be more fair. Now, I want to emphasize, first of all, that anything we do is going to be unfair to our, our workforce. These are folks who worked hard every day, provided vital services, paid into the system, and 60% of the problem is that government did not make its payments. Uh, because we used our pension payment, instead of paying it, we forewent it to borrow against the structural deficit, which I'll come back to in a second. But the point is, we have seen serious uh, spikes in the city pension schedule to the point where it led to the layoff of 3,000 employees here in, in the city of Chicago. So if we don't get pension reform done, uh, we will see serious, serious consequences for our local governments. That includes the city of Chicago, it includes Cook County, and DuPage, and Kane, and everywhere else. So it needs to happen. Uh, I have uh, I voted on uh, Senate Bill 1, which was the, the Speaker's plan. It was tough, and I didn't necessarily like it. It's personal for me because I had a mother who, uh, who, who still works at Rush University Medical Center, was about to be vested in a, a pension plan that they changed for people who had not been there for 30 years when she'd been there for 26 years. So I know what it looks like to be counting on something and have it not come through. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that we're getting to a point where we are about to spend one in every five dollars we spend as a state mm -hmm. on our pension. So we have to do something <coughs> if we don't and don't provide that template for uh, local governments, we will be in serious trouble. The other thing I would just note is that 
we have some larger budget problems as a state. And part of it is that we have this really strange tax code where uh, we have a flat tax where working families pay a higher percentage of their income in taxes compared to those with uh, the most dollars, where two-thirds of corporations pay no income tax, where we're one of few states in the Midwest that taxes uh, only goods and not services. So in addition to continuing to make the reforms we need to make, both on the pension side and in the way that we spend our state dollars, mm -hmm. we also have to have a really serious conversation about how we can lower the tax burden on working families, but raise the revenue that we need to actually make the critical investments that we need to, to grow our economy and, and provide for Illinois' future. So mm -hmm. long answer to your question, but I hope it, it did answer it, sir. Well, I learned a lot just in that. I had nothing, didn't know that the um, tax code had anything to do with what was going on with the pension. Absolutely. If you are just now tuning in, call. We are having a open dialogue. We're discussing with Illinois State Representative Christian Mitchell of the 26th District. Give us a call. Join in the conversation at... 312-738-1060 and as you can see state representative mitchell's office as is at 449 east 35th street of the 26th <coughs> district now before we got the phone call from our caller we were talking about criminal justice right. and um i don't think we believe i don't believe we hit on this new mandatory minimum for handguns. Did we talk about that? We talked about it a little bit. Okay. Just a little bit. Okay. Can you explain to the, the viewers what is that? So so basically the proposal would say if you are caught with a gun and have not applied for a FOID card or a concealed carry permit, we now have concealed carry as of, of, mm -hmm. of June, um, that your penalty would be enhanced. You have to face a mandatory prison sentence. So in part it's a response to a judicial system where according to studies the average person is spending two months mm -hmm. in uh, in prison or just getting probation for uh, having guns and we know that having more weapons on our streets is inevitably going to make our streets potentially less safe. There's a lot of conversation about how well we need to make sure the good guys have guns and etc but when you add guns to a situation it generally makes our streets in, in many ways uh, less safe. So this would say if you are if you have not uh, filed a FOID application, a concealed carry application, and you are caught carrying a gun that you don't have a license to have, that it would increase your penalty. Now, as I said in my, my previous answer, there's real concern about how we don't catch up first-time offenders mm -hmm. uh, in, this, in this kind of dragnet. Uh, and how we make sure that we're really targeting the folks who are dangerous, and those are the felons and, and the gang members. And even then, there's still potentially some unintended consequences. But I think what a lot of people would like to see is, one, how is there wiggle room on those first-time offenders? And two, how do we make sure that as we're potentially putting more folks in prison, that we're getting some folks out of prison who don't need to be there? We've right. got... 12, 13, 14,000 people in for crimes that have overwhelmingly to do with drug addiction right. and with a very real public health problem and a war on drugs that we've seen nationally is not working. How do we have a conversation about those folks, both in general, but certainly simultaneously if we're talking about putting more people in prison? So I think that's a real concern of a lot of black legislators and a lot of, of, of uh, liberal folks and even some of the more conservative people mm -hmm. who think that the way we're spending money on prisons is costing us just too much money yeah. for the value that we're getting when we got people going in and out of it like a revolving door. And how everything is connected. Right. Education, criminal justice, concealment <coughs> carry. We have another caller. Hi, caller. Hello. Um, my question is about the concealed carry legislation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, from what I've heard, there is still some concern with uh, it not being... Uh, really uh, the final document that it ought to be. For example, I had heard that you could conceal and carry as many guns as you wanted to. You weren't limited to just carrying and concealing one. So could you uh, let me know what you think about whether that is or is not in the uh, legislation? Yeah, so uh, I think we're pretty close to a final document. There are some real concerns. So um, there is there there are certain ways in which the rule is written that give some kind of exemptions that, that folks are concerned about, like the definition of a restaurant and how a, a restaurant, uh, what percentage of liquor a restaurant can sell to whether or not it's considered a bar to where you wouldn't be able to, to, to carry your gun, has some real questions. And there are real implement, implementation concerns about this, frankly. Um, the Illinois State Police, before this even happened, already had a backlog of in the tens of thousands for applications. We had two out of 102 counties actually reporting people who have been adjudicated by our court system to be mentally ill, so folks who certainly should not have handguns. 
those records have not been processed in the way that they should. The Illinois State Police has admitted they're having trouble processing this backlog of applications, which currently sits somewhere between 60 and 90 days. So there's real concern, I think, and I expressed concern on the floor when this was happening about whether or not Illinois is really ready for this law and whether or not we have the personnel to keep people safe, given how many more people are going to have guns. And, and for the most part, 98% of these people are going to be law-abiding citizens who are just trying to protect themselves or exercise their Second Amendment rights. But even when you're talking tens of thousands of people, even 2% of people who are uh, bad apples or are going to uh, be straw purchasers that are flooding yeah. our streets here in the city of Chicago with illegal guns, that's a problem. Now, the one thing I will say is that we also passed, I was proud to be a chief co-sponsor of uh, a FOID card verification law. So basically, it's uh, universal background checks for private handgun sales. So if I sell you a gun, I have to verify with the state police that you have a valid FOID card or concealed carry permit. And if I get caught not doing so, we can now prosecute you. So as of January 1, that will be law. Now, it's going to take a while for that to get down to the street, but it's going to help us crack down on the flow of illegal guns. So I was very proud of that. But I, I think your concerns are well-founded, ma'am, and I'm going to continue to stay vigilant on this. All right. If you're tuning in now, please give us a call. We're sitting in the studio with Representative Christian Mitchell of the 26th District, and I believe we have another caller. Hi, caller. Hello. Hi. Yes. What I wanted to know is, I know a person that has a weapon <clears throat> for years, and they they had it uh, uh, at one time registered, and you know it just slipped through. So how would they uh, go through having it re uh, re, re registered? So uh, my imagination would be they would just go through the general um, FOID card process or concealed carry permit process, so they would just need to call the Illinois State Police. I'm not uh, aware of what the hotline is, but I'm pretty sure if you go to their website, you'll be able to determine uh, what that number would look like. So I would imagine they just have to go back through uh, that process. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And when you say the FOID, card, the FOID card, can you tell them what that stands for? So it's a firearm owner identification card, and then there's going to be a separate, and I believe eventually merged, uh, concealed carry license. I think it's called a CCL, but don't quote me on that. I'm not an expert on that particular okay. piece of legislation. Gotcha. All right, so we have a lot going on. Great. What um, <clears throat> is going on with our state budget? I know we talked about that a little yeah. bit with the pension and a little bit with education funding, but what, what's going on overall in Springfield with our budget? So we, we have serious issues. So as I cited, <coughs> uh, I view education as the key to opportunity, as a ladder out of poverty, as the thing that got me to the place where I am and as, as the great equalizer. And had the original proposed budget um, gone into place, had we not gotten um, a revenue bump from our income tax, uh, we would have been in a situation where we would have cut education by a billion dollars over the past three years. One billion dollars. In a time when we have dropout rates of 50 percent, when 39 percent of African American males are graduating high school, we've been cutting education. So a lot of people, a lot of my colleagues across the aisle talk about waste, fraud, and abuse. And don't get me wrong, I want to crack down on waste, fraud, and abuse. We need to continue to make sure we budget for performance, that as programs aren't working, we are, we are taking those monies and using them for things that we do know work. At the same time, I have to go back to what I said before about the fact that we have a very serious revenue problem in the state of Illinois. We have a fair, we have a flat tax that makes working families pay something like 14, 15 percent of their income in, in income taxes, while those who have the most are not necessarily paying a fair share. We have a, a tax where two thirds of corporations aren't paying any income taxes. Now, there's there are some high road corporations that are doing the right thing that understand that they are citizens of a democratic republic, that the roads and bridges that we supply through government as the People's Republic mm -hmm. uh, are how they get their goods and services to and fro. But there are apparently some folks who are not doing that, and we're not saying that you know you are a bad person. What we are saying is you need to make sure that you pay your fair share. Mm -hmm. And we've got a sales tax base that effectively was made for an agrarian economy in the 18th and 19th century. So we have to have a real conversation about how we get the resources we need to run government in the way that it should run, even as we continue to find ways to make government more effective, more efficient. And if we don't, then we're going to continue to have a large percentage of our roads and bridges that are structurally deficient. Those are good jobs that can't be outsourced, that could be going to people in my district and in our community. And we have to continue to invest in education and research and the kind of things that make Illinois such a competitive place to do business. And if we don't do those things, if we continue to have a state budget that doesn't reflect those realities, mm -hmm. we will continue to see unemployment. And when we see unemployment, we see people who can't pay taxes. When they can't pay taxes, we get less tax revenue and it becomes this very vicious cycle. <coughs> 
seems like you guys have your hands full. We do. <laughs> we definitely do. Um, this is just a, another question off the cuff. Since sure. you are the state rep, how do you work with your um, corresponding aldermen from the city? Yeah. to make sure that the interests of your constituents are addressed. So I'll give you a perfect example. So we've got a, uh, a pro we're about to do a 35th Street kind of reconstruction on the bridge, which mm -hmm. has been kind of falling apart for years. And so I work very closely with my uh, my alderman, Will Burns, mm -hmm. uh, on that project. So the Illinois Department of Transportation is working with the Chicago Department of Transportation mm -hmm. to make sure that we have joint funds that go into that project. So that's one good example. Okay. But effectively, when, I, when there's infrastructure money in Springfield, I'm calling my aldermen who mm -hmm. are talking to their constituents constituents and saying what projects do we have that make sense that are going to be job multipliers in our community that I can be helpful with. Okay. Uh, and, and when folks walk into my office and they need a city service, uh, my alderman's right next door, so I, I point them in that direction. Okay. But my goal is always to make sure that I'm talking to my alderman every single day to make sure that the state is doing everything that it can uh, to to meet community needs. So I have a great relationship with all of, all of my aldermen and, and I, I am uh, honored by the work they do. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's very hard and a lot more people are going to see their aldermen than are coming to see their state reps. So I, I just appreciate the work that they do. And I was that was my next question. I was going to ask you, how um, are your constituents, how are the citizens utilizing you in your office? Are, are you getting those knocks on the door? So I, I do. So I, you know, I get the knocks on the door. I get the the, uh, the, <coughs> the talks while I'm uh, lifting weights at the gym, or you know, people. Right. I and mean, people in in my district are very demanding of their state representative, and it's why it's such an honor to serve them. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly, I mean, look, people were were very concerned about concealed carry. They they remain mm -hmm. very concerned about kind of criminal justice writ large. Um, they're really concerned about the way we're budgeting. They're concerned about um, some of the programs they rely on, like the community care program that allows the elderly to stay in their home that I sponsored a bill to, to fully fund. Um, you know, they're concerned about uh, the Medicaid expansion that we passed because so many people rely upon Medicaid to, to be able to keep their jobs. Um, and and I, I actually um, had a, a really great series of conversations with some, um, some really just wonderful young mothers in my district who mm. uh, are really struggling uh, with, with child care. Right. And so you've got this interesting situation where you get a, a young woman who finally gets, a young, or an older woman, mm -hmm. who finally gets a job that can kind of get her over the hump, allow her to start to save a little bit, um, start to invest in some of the things that they need, home improvements or, or, or resources for the child. And because of the way our current child care system works in the state of Illinois, they reach this threshold where their copay goes up enough and their subsidy goes down enough that they're now having to deal with this question of, well, do I, I take care of the child I love or do I go to work? And, and, and that, to me, is a really false choice. I mean, I was really fortunate to have my grandparents growing up who were free child care for my mother, but if we hadn't had them, what would we do? So, right. Child uh, care I, is very expensive. Very expensive mm -hmm. and very essential because this isn't, this isn't a handout we're talking about. This right. is, this is, is uh, women and men who want to work, mm -hmm. who, who have a job, and who are just mm -hmm. looking for a little bit of help to just get over that threshold so mm -hmm. that they can be self-sufficient. So I'm, I'm going to be sponsoring a bill in the, in the veto and session to kind of raise that cap. And it's temporary. And it's temporary. Right. This isn't something they're subsisting on their entire right. lives. It's saying, I am right at the cusp. It is mm -hmm. in the public interest that I get over so that I can be self-sufficient and start to lift as I climb and be an example in my community. Right. So I, I'm really interested in helping those folks because, you know, without my, my mother who raised me all on her own, I wouldn't be here. Right. Well, again, if you're just tuning in, we had an opportunity today to speak to Illinois State Representative Christian Mitchell. Um, we are almost out of time, and we had an opportunity to cover a lot of ground. Okay. But I wanted to ask you, Representative, what would you like to um, leave to the viewers for final comments? So so first of all, I would just say thank you to tuning in. I would say thank you again to, to CAN-TV. Your engagement and commitment to making sure that elected leaders can reach their constituents is, is just fantastic. And, and for all of you watching, I would just say continue to hold our feet to the fire. Continue to call my office. Continue to um, to 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 make sure that we're doing what we need to do as 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 your government. I'm going to continue to work very very hard for you. Um, and I think that there is real momentum for change in Springfield. This education reform initiative that I mentioned is extremely exciting to me. There's a real conversation going on as our current income tax structure expires about. Um, how we can actually get the revenue we need to function as a state and invest in the things we need to invest in to be competitive. So I'm honored to continue to fight for you, and I hope that you will continue to work with me and, and continue to, to elect me as your state representative. So thank you guys so much for the time, for tuning in, for being engaged and involved. Again, if you need to reach Representative Mitchell, if you are a 26th district constituent, you can give him a call. 
That's his number. You see his email address. He's at 773-924-1755. And you also see the location of his district office. Thank you again for appearing on Thank our you. Political Forum show. I'm your host, Dartesia Pitts, and also a board member. We'll see you guys next Wednesday, same bat time and channel. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good night.